Hello, dear friends. The Battle of the Atlantic was fought for life and death by German submarines aimed at establishing a naval blockade of the British Isles, and in this way, winning the war. There are examples of pointless violence by the fighting parties. When German submariners and pilots were executing sailors who survived the sinking of ships, at the same time there were examples of Allied, particularly American pilots, shooting German submariners from destroyed vessels that had already raised the white flag. Nevertheless, the fighting parties generally showed a relatively gentlemanly attitude towards each other. Today we will look at the memoirs of two captains, of a sunken British vessel and of a German submarine. This video was sponsored by a free online game, World of Warships. The types of warships that are presented in this video are of course available in the game too. World of Warships is not just a game, it's a floating digital museum displaying breathtaking recreations of not just the most fearsome vessels of the First and Second World Wars, but also many blueprints and designs of ships that never saw battle. These ships have been given new life in the game's virtual dockyards. New content is released every month, whether it's new ships, in-game nations, cosmetics, or even ship classes. You can always count on enjoying fresh gameplay experiences in World of Warships' stunning 12v12 arenas. During registration, use the code WARSHIPS to get exclusive rewards including a bunch of doubloons, credits, premium account time, and a free ship after you complete 15 battles. Believe me, 15 battles are not enough to enjoy the amazing graphics of the game. Dynamic weather effects and historically genuine ships from 10 countries will immerse you in the atmosphere of incredible naval battles. Experience new emotions with World of Warships. Well now, let's begin. On May 13, 1941, a German U-boat torpedoed the transport ship Benraki while crossing the Atlantic in a convoy. The story that followed was told by the captain of the sunken ship, William Aiden Jones. I was on a capsized boat. As the submarine appeared on the surface, the Germans did a circle, picking up boxes, packages of supplies, perhaps liquor and food. After a time, the submarine approached us. There were four Germans getting out of the deckhouse. The guy who, in my opinion, was the commander, a stocky guy, looked up at us from the top of his head and spat at us. Then he shouted, What is this vessel? Then one of my seamen, for absolutely no reason at all, to my mind, came out with, Queen Elizabeth. I was like, yeah, now they are about to open fire, or else we're just getting in trouble. The German asked again, What is this vessel? And someone told him the true name, Benraki. They circled around us for a while and laughed, and then headed off to the northeast, without asking if we had water, if we had any wounded or whatever. The vessel sank and buried one in three of us in the water with it. We searched around the wreck and took up everyone we could, and the several gallons of water and galette jars we could find. After that, looking around, we said to ourselves, One thing we have to do is make it out of this if we can. We were halfway between Brazil and North Africa. My only thought was to find the shortest way to land. I set a course to the northeast. There were about 58 of us in a lifeboat, with room for 48 people. Not enough space for everyone to sit. The boat leaked badly. It was on the keel blocks for a long time, and we were forced to scoop out the water for two days until the wood began to swell and the cracks closed. After that, it became easier for us. The windless days were the hardest for us. The sun burned like hell. We cut the tarpaulin sheeting of the boat so that men were able to hide their heads from the sun. The life jackets kept us safe from the burns. We started by providing everyone with five ounces of water a day two in the morning, two in the evening, and a galette. Sometime later, after several rainfalls at night, we managed to collect some water in our spread sail. At the same time, it was heard that the men under the sail were trying to suck the moisture out of the material. However, the crew all behaved very well. These were all great guys. The second day, we saw a ship far off in the distance, but they never saw us. The tenth day, we saw a plane, but nobody noticed us from it as well. On the morning of the thirteenth day, I had to sit on a barrel of water to be sure that no one would take any chances to be on their own. Then someone said, Hey, Captain, I think I see green lights. Oh, I said, you must be dreaming. Looking around, I spotted green lights, which looked like Brighton Pier. 
We lit a flare, and then another. After a while, I noticed that the lights were getting closer to us. Shortly, I saw a red light above the green lights and figured out that it was a hospital ship coming towards us. It was the hospital ship Oxfordshire. They boarded 56 men, everyone who survived. One of the deceased was a Chinese seaman and laid everyone in their bunks. All of the guys were whistling and shouting happily. It was close to hysteria. Then one of the nurses handed out tea and scones, which was the most enjoyable drink we ever had. We were nearly completely dehydrated. For all those 13 days, we were losing two and a half pounds a day. I don't know how much longer we would have survived. We covered about 530 miles in the lifeboat. It probably had an engine and came within about 100 miles of Sierra Leone, navigating only by Polaris and using the boat's compass. And now we will look at the memoirs of the famous submariner Otto Kretschmer. The basis of everything is knowledge, whether it's in peacetime, whether it's in training, in combat tactics, or something else. You have to know your trade. You have to understand things that are going on in the field of battle that you can't see or you only see a glimpse of. You should try to figure out the mindset of your opponent, let's say an aircraft pilot. You should try to see what the crews of vessels that have made the long way from America's shores or left British ports are up to as they wait to be replaced by another shift. You should know what the weather is like above, whether the wind is blowing in the face of the seamen at the observation posts, whether the moon is bright. You have to keep all these details in your head so that you are fully prepared to act at a given moment. Nowadays, it is difficult to look back at the Battle of the Atlantic, because in those days, submarines were considered with a lot of contempt. They were considered pirates or something like that. But these days, when we discuss with people who have been on the opposite sides, with naval officers, the conversation is as if it were a soccer match. The atmosphere is cheerful and friendly, you know. They're just nice guys coming together in the same company. It is difficult to visualize that years ago, these men used to go to sea in order to wipe each other out. Ironically, we did not hate the enemy, not in my side at least, and I was regretting the sinking of the enemy's vessels. Some of them were very beautiful. We did not worry about the people at all, because I was confident that they would have enough time to get into a lifeboat, and many times I helped them. Whenever I came across a seaman on a life raft, I would hoist him on board, give him a lifeboat, and set him on his way home, advising him of the course. I would give them water and everything they needed so I never worried about the men. We knew we needed their vessels and, first of all, their tankers carrying the most valuable cargo to overpower the enemy. Back then, it was like that. And here is how he describes his battle on March 17, 1941. Together with Kretschmer, his friend Joachim Shepka acted at night against the convoy NH-112. But his luck was bad. The first British destroyers forced the U-100 underwater and then damaged it with depth charges. Shepka had no options to resurface or wait until the extreme water pressure would crush his submarine into a rag. The famous submariner decided to resurface and give a fight. Despite the fact that his torpedo launchers were not ready to fire, he was hopeful that he would have enough time to reload and launch an attack on the destroyers. U-100 appeared on the surface at about 3 a.m., resurfacing only 500 meters from the destroyer Vanok. The vessel was equipped with a primitive Type 286 radar, which was deemed inefficient in detecting objects such as submarines. But something unprecedented happened. The Vanox radar operator detected a contact with the U-100. Then the destroyer hit Shepka's boat and sank it. While the destroyer Vanok was picking up the survivors out of the water, the destroyer Walker was circulating around it, searching for other submarines. At that moment, U-99, under the command of Otto Kretschmer, was half a mile from the location of Shepka's wreck. The man on watch on the bridge spotted the destroyers and gave the signal for an urgent dive. It is possible that the dive of the U-99 was a mistake, as the submarine had already been detected by the walker. Next, let us look at the memoirs of Otto Kretschmer. Having been caught by the depth charges, I was forced to resurface as the water was already rushing into the boat. My boat was motionless in the middle of a big spot of fuel oil, leaning on its starboard side. We were being shelled by two enemy destroyers. I have to say they were shooting very inaccurately. There were water columns exploding in the air all around the boat, but the 40mm anti-aircraft guns could not cause much damage to the submarine. 
Only the paint was falling off the hull of the boat, but the stern of my vessel was already going underwater. The boat was sinking, and my seamen, crowded together closer to the stern, were trapped in the water. I had nothing I could do to help them. I thought of my crew and wanted them to be picked up and taken as captives, and I could only do this by getting in contact with the destroyer closest to us, which was the HMS Walker. Over the years, its commander, Donald McIntyre, became my friend. We managed to demonstrate by signal light that part of my crew was in the water. I requested the captain to pick them up. I had nothing more to do, but the British passed us by and picked up almost half of the crew. We lost three seamen. One officer sank with the boat. He was unable to make it to the upper deck in time. Two vanished when they were overboard. I don't know what happened. When I boarded the destroyer, they informed me that they couldn't spot anyone else overboard. I spent six years in prisoner of war camps, and after the war, I joined the West German Navy. Well, let me remind you that if you want to immerse yourself in the atmosphere of amazing naval battles, then play World of Warships. During registration, use the code WARSHIPS to get exclusive rewards, including a bunch of doubloons, credits, premium account time, and a free ship after you complete 15 battles. Happy hunting, Captain!